hello everyone uh, welcome back uh, this session is about key considerations in AI, AI in finance. The financial services is a highly regulated industry and uh, there are a lot of banks, insurance companies, fintech companies are rolling out AI. Uh, there's a lot of considerations and you know, risk management uh, practices that need to be uh, looked into as, as this happens. We have an amazing panel uh, to discuss these issues. Uh, Michelle Alade, uh, from Airlines Data Card Services, Patrick Hall uh, from uh, BNH AI, a principal scientist, and John Hill, who's a professor at Model Risk Management, Alex uh, from Kotu Management, and Pawan Wadva from uh, JP Morgan and Chase are joining us. Uh, with that, I'll just start with like each of you to you know probably go in that order. Michelle, Patrick, John, Alex, Pawan, uh, could you just introduce yourself and you know what you're doing? your current role and uh, yeah, just a couple of lines. Yeah, sounds good. So I'll start. So Michelle Alade here. Um, I'm an enterprise risk professional with a specific focus right now in model risk management. I currently serve as the bank model risk officer at Alliance Data Card Services. And in that particular function, my role is to manage the risk inherent to the use of models, including AI applications. Great. Patrick? Sure. Hi, I'm Patrick Hall. I'm a principal scientist at a small law firm in Washington, D.C. Uh, that, that focuses on uh, AI and, and data analytics risk. Um, I'm also a visiting professor at the George Washington University Business School and uh, spend a lot of time over at h2o.ai, which is right down the road and um, helping them build out some of their, their early responsible AI functionality. And I, I still try to help them when I can. Alex? Sure. Um, I'm Alex Zdorczyk. I run uh, data science at Code2. Um, we're an investment firm. We have public and private investments. So investing in startups to public equities, and we use data and models to help us source and diligence investments. Awesome. John? Uh, John Hill here. Um, I've been working in various aspects of model risk management for nearly 20 years, first at Citigroup, then at Morgan Stanley, where I ran a validation team, and then at Credit Suisse, where I was in charge of uh, model risk governance, global model risk governance. And since uh, I have moved uh, to academics, uh, so I'm now a professor at NYU Tandon School of Risk Engineering. And I'm happy to say that I presented this last winter what I believe to be the first graduate level course in model risk management offered at any university that I, that I know of. Uh, so it's the knowledge, understanding of model risk is not really penetrated uh, very far into the graduate students in finance so far, but uh, I think offering courses like this is a good first step. And I did have one session on um, AI ML was presented as a guest lecturer by August Sujanto, who's head of uh, um, uh, model risk management at Wells Fargo. So if you're familiar with him, he gave a very good presentation, introductory lecture. So. Uh, also, as an academic, I'm free now to publish and awesome. publishing a set of papers on model risk management. And in some of them, I identify what I think are the major weaknesses in the way in model risk discipline at all the leading banks today, which I don't think I ever would have gotten permission for if I were still working for a bank. Oh, that's great. Uh, uh, finally, uh, Pawan, uh, you know, uh, could you do your intro? Uh, thanks, Krishna. So my name is Pavan Wadwa, and uh, I'm a part of the model risk management team at uh, JP Morgan. I've been with JP Morgan about 20 years. Uh, the first 15 years was spent on the on the front office side, uh, mostly in uh, rates uh, research. And then the last five years, I've been on the on the model risk side. I run a center of excellence in machine learning within the model review function. Awesome. This is great. Uh, we'll start with Michelle. Uh, Michelle, could you just give a two minute overview of model risk management? Uh, a lot of data scientists are entering this industry the first time. Uh, I discovered this concept you know, myself two years ago. Uh, it would be great to just you know, get an overview of what this topic is about. Yeah, sure. So as you can tell from the name, model risk management is a risk function, which main focus is to manage the risk inherent with the use of models. Um, as you know, models are used for decision making. So it's critical that those models can be trusted. And um, the issues that come from um, 
for use of the model. So um, are pretty important. So we need to mitigate the risk with, which come from the fact that um, the model can be designed poorly during model development. And uh, because of that, the output of those models lead to um, inaccurate decision making. Uh, the second piece of the, of, of the equation is that models are just misused, mainly due to lack of understanding of the uh, assumptions that come into building the model or just the limitation of use of that particular model. And um, the function, the model risk management function came from the banking industry and slowly got adopted in the insurance industry. But with the use of the proliferation of AI and machine learning models across pretty much all different sectors, we can now see positions such as AI risk manager. And for my part, I think it's, it's the right move because anywhere models are being used, there's definitely a need to have a model risk management function. Awesome, that's a great overview. Uh, coming to Alex, you know, uh, you're in a slightly different uh, field at KOTU. Uh, how do you think about implementing AI and ML at KOTU? You know, where, where has it come to play? How did you make that decision? Could you just like go into that? Sure, yes. And I, and I think it makes sense to first give an overview of our business a little bit, right? So we're in the investment management industry. At the end of the day, um, our business is picking companies, whether they're private early stage startups or sort of late stage public companies um, to invest in. And as you can imagine, there's, you know, and I've been doing this now for five years. And I think there was a strong intuition at the beginning that we should be able to use data, all types of data and thereby models to help with those decisions. And so when we began the data science effort at KOTU, the, the first question is, okay, well, maybe this is a nice to have additional piece of research we could use um, to, to make decisions. And what we found is there actually are places in selecting investments where data can be extremely powerful. So we buy large data sets, think everything from consumer transaction data to clickstream data to you know, business purchase data. Those data sets model how the economy acts in real time. And sort of on a micro level too, is they can track sort of the movements of individual companies and the su success and fortunes or the misfortunes of individual companies. So we use models then and AI, however you want to characterize it, we, we use statistical models to then forecast or now cast how the economy or how a given company is performing. You can compare the outputs of those models to what on Wall Street is called consensus. So essentially the average of what equity research thinks should happen. And when you get large divergences between what the average, the consensus thinks and what you think based on your data-driven, model-driven view, um, then you find investment opportunities. So that was the sort of motivating um, the premise on, in which we built AI or machine learning into, into our workflow in the first place. And I think where we, we found it to be not just an additional diligence tool, but actually to be quite critical. And today, I think in certain areas of, of, of the modern market, you really can't compete if you don't have sort of a data-driven and thereby model-driven view of what's going on. Um, I think though, there are limitations. And I think that's where this discussion comes in. And in, in my space, those limitations, we're, we're mostly modeling financial statements, right? So you're mostly modeling quarterly time series. Um, and I think where the limitations really come in is around interpretation and around models stop making sense if the person building the model and the person making a judgment of the model aren't in sync about what makes sense. So I give a really obvious example. Um, imagine if you have aggregate consumer spending data for any company. And so you have aggregate consumer spending data for McDonald's and for Chipotle, two different companies. And you're trying to predict the revenue of both McDonald's and Chipotle. You might think, oh, very easy. Let me aggregate my data by quarter because companies report on quarterly schedules. And then let me just compare it to the reporting numbers, look at the quarter, quarter to date number. And that's my prediction for the revenue of Chipotle and McDonald's. That would be the data science model driven view. The financial analyst will tell you that makes no sense. You see, Chipotle owns all of their own stores. And so every dollar spent at Chipotle is Chipotle revenue. Whereas McDonald's is a franchise business that 
at least in majorities in the business of licensing their brands to franchisees. So every dollar spent at McDonald's is not directly and not even linearly necessarily correlated to McDonald's revenue, right? So we have you know, many such instances like that where the interpretation of what comes out of the model and what goes into the model is, is far more important than the statistical method somebody may have applied that spits out quarterly time series forecasts um, from say aggregate transactional data. That's one example. Absolutely. I mean, we, we, have, we have worked with a capital allocation group in a large bank and a very similar problem where the business stakeholders could not understand how the model was working. And so coming back to, you know, uh, Pavan at JP Morgan. So modern risk management has been there for almost a decade, more than a decade, right? Now, what is changing with the advent of AI and ML in banks? And how are you governing these new kinds of models? Uh, you know, what are some of the challenges that you're you know, going through today? Right. Um, so, Krishna, the, you know, obviously, you know, banks are some of the most uh, heavily regulated entities in the world. And so model governance is a key function within any given bank. Uh, I mean, we have several hundred people, for example, that are within the model governance model review function that are tasked with uh, reviewing every single model before it goes into production. So, um, you know, because it's a, it's a fairly well thought through process that we've had, especially for statistical models, and, you know, we've honed it to a kind of a science over the last, you know, 10 years or so, um, the advent of MLAI was not very hard for us to capture within the existing framework. And, and let, me, let me explain to you what, what, what I mean by that. So, so basically, you know, within the framework that we have where we capture model risks related to statistical models, what we had to do was we had to identify the additional risks that ML models pose over and above what a statistical model would pose and incorporate procedures to mitigate those risks. To give you an example, you know, there's infrastructure risk. You know, you could have latency problems, you could have computational bottlenecks, you could have real-time recalibration risks in the event that you know you do perform real-time recalibration. It's not a problem right now, but a few years from now, I'm sure that there will be real-time recalibration. There's data risk, there's reputational risk, there's all sorts of legal and compliance risks. So what we did was we came up with a set of additional standards that model developers need to abide by and mitigate some of those sources of risks before we are able to approve a machine learning model. Got it. Great. So, John, as you have been teaching model risk management and as you've seen the change of model risk management over the years, what are some of the gaps that you're seeing when it comes to applying these processes on AI and ML models, like in, as you talk to many of these banks and, and meet people at conferences? Well, as Pavan pointed out, um, the basic infrastructure for model risk management was defined by a document issued by the FRB called SR 11-7. And that platform, that document is comprehensive enough that, as Bavon said, uh, AI models fit very well into it. And the document simply says that all models have to be validated to a certain standard. AI models, ML models, present particular challenges, uh, the first and foremost being the difficulty of transparency, uh, the lack of explainability of the model. So that presents special challenges to the second line of defense. Those are the, that's the validation team. Uh, to uh, validate a machine learning model because uh, very often these models are like black boxes and they're hard to penetrate. I I've had this idea for some time um, and I couldn't get confirmation on it um, that one solution to getting around the explainability problem is um, as a little bit of background, validation is the second line of defense. First line of defense are the developers of the models. Second line of defense also can develop its own models. We call them benchmarks that are used as part of the validation process. And here's a key point. Those models are not subject to validation uh, at the same standard because obviously a validation team can't validate its own benchmark models. So I thought, well, why not use develop ML benchmarks and use those to validate the ML champion model? Use a cha ML champion a challenger to validate an ML champion. And I thought it was just a, a kind of a comical thought because there are obvious issues with possible collusion between machine learning models and a lack of credibility. But uh, I was in a, a 
Nordic's risk conference uh, just the past two days, and I presented this at a chat table, and the fellow who's head of uh, AI validation at Nordia says, we've been doing that for the last two years. We use ML to validate ML, and it, it's not a contradiction at all. But my question was, how did the regulators deal with that? Uh, you know, did that pass muster with the regulators? Because I presented this question to one of our senior regulators, David Palmer, and he basically refused to answer the question. <laughs> he said, we don't have a position on that yet. Um, but what he said was that the European regulators, Nordia is a Finnish bank, but they're all over Northern Europe. He said that the regulators have basically taken an arm's distance approach, that so they're not telling them not to do it, but they haven't presented a final opinion on it either. So he said they're going to continue uh, showing the way. He mentioned a few other European banks that are doing this. I don't know if any American banks are doing it. Uh, perhaps Pavan could like to that. I'm pretty sure uh, none of the banks I worked at, which was Morgan Stanley Credit Suisse and Citigroup, got even close to doing that, to using ML to validate ML. That's a great, that's a great segue into, uh, I guess, you know, Patrick, who's like a subject matter expert in explainable AI. So Patrick, where does like explainable AI and responsible AI can be, like can come to help here, you know, to yeah, sort of help yeah. you know, international situations? I'll, you know, I'll, I'll try to be helpful here. Uh, first, I want to I want to jump in as a cheerleader for benchmark models. I, I I don't think that that is a. I think it's a really good idea. Now, of course, I'm not a regulator, so uh, I'm not sure how much my opinion matters. But but I've done some writing on the subject of benchmark models and and some use them in practice and, and think they're helpful. Also, I, you know, I want to jump in and say that you know, personally, I think that that transparency is the is the fundamental risk control. Um, with transparency, and, and you can control risk without transparency, and people have done that in the past and, and perhaps for decades. But I think you know the fuller the transparency, the fuller the debuggability, and the fuller the uh, potential governance. So, so I think that the transparency is sort of the, the baseline requirement, and if we have that, we can, we can build off that in smart ways. Um, in terms of, of, of the sort of broader topic of responsible AI, which includes transparency and um, considerations for uh, discrimination testing and remediation and considerations for data privacy and security, I, I think that you know it, it's a double-edged sword and that it's hard to do all these things inside banks because banks are, are large, complex organizations with many, many, many business processes that are also highly regulated and, and have a high degree of, of public scrutiny upon them. So, so I think, I think that, that it's always difficult to do machine learning under those kinds of uh, constraints. And but, but I, you know, I think the the silver lining is that that banks, you know, even beyond big tech, are 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 probably the best suited culturally. To, to do responsible AI, right? They, they understand that they work within constraints of regulation and, and constraints of model validation and constraints of model audit. And so, you know, that I think that the culturally it's a good fit. Um, of course, you know, things can always slip through the cracks and and um, I'll, I'll, I'll leave it at that and, and let other panelists chime in. I don't, I don't want to dominate the conversation here, but, but basically I think Banks are good, good at responsible AI, but but it's still a challenge. Absolutely. So, like Michelle, uh, you know, let's say when uh, you know uh, Alliance is trying to deploy mach and machine learning models, what are some of the key risks that you are taking into picture? You know, making sure that you're safely deploying models and they are maintainable over time. Yeah, sure. So, <clears throat> to piggyback on some of the points, uh, in order for a model to be approved for deployment the model needs to be trusted, right? So the model risk management group needs to come in with a stamp stating that they, they've done the due diligence and they believe that the model is fit for purpose. And um, the, the risk inherent to the use of machine learning models that we just uh, reviewed and the other panelists just discussed a little bit needs to be um, adequately addressed. So if we think of you know, potential bias within either the data or the algorithm itself, the lack of explainability and the type of control around, especially depending on the, on the model purpose, right? So if you're dealing with um, a model within the credit risk space, a model that will be used to approve or deny loan application, obviously we'll be holding that model to a higher standard than uh, um, a model that's used to um, 
help with uh, re uh, resource management for a call center, for instance, right? Mm -hmm. Those are the, 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 the type of, um, of risk that we need to understand and make sure that they, they're well controlled for. In addition to um, how is the model performing, you know, after being, after being developed yep. and, you know, what type of metrics are in place and how do we monitor the model once it is in, in production. One of the challenge that um, we face, and I speak from, a, you know, uh, an entire model risk management practice, looking at small organization and also big organization, but mainly for the small organization that had a very robust traditional uh, uh, model risk management framework that was pretty much had of once the model is, is built, then the, the MRM team comes in and performs the validation. The challenge that we're facing now with those um, AI and machine learning models that, are, that needs to be deployed really quickly is that we need to come up with an agile process where um, a developer and validator come uh, work together in addition to all of the risk uh, control function that are relevant to the equation thinking of the compliance team, the, the um, data and privacy team, uh, making sure that all of the key risks across the model development cycle are addressed while the model is being built and all of the controls are also implemented before the model actually moves into production. And then ultimately we have um, the ability to see uh, how the model is performing when it's in use. So that's the key challenge moving from that um, pretty rigid model risk management framework to one that is agile and that is efficient to true um, AI uh, uh, scalability. Got it, got it. That's awesome. So, you know, like maybe a general question to the panel uh, is like, where do you see like AI, the responsible usage of AI uh, going in the next, you know, two to five years in financial services industry overall? Is this something that, you know, financial institutions are gonna embrace uh, the, the, the process and make sure that, you know, as Michelle articulated and other people articulated, that they're essentially going through uh, uh, explainability, transparency, monitoring throughout the uh, model development lifecycle and are able to uh, safely launch models. What, how, are, how are the financial institutions thinking from a two to five year lens around the AI usage of AI, the growth of AI and responsible AI? Maybe, Go ahead. Maybe Pawan, you wanna start? Yeah, so uh, yeah, so let me let me give you my view on this. Um, so you know, obviously, um, the uh, AI, ML AI has already you know been incorporated in various uh, shapes and form in the banking industry, and of course, uh, how much it's been incorporated is a bit of a function of two things in my view. The first is uh, availability of large scale data. Now, if you look at the retail bank, for example, obviously the retail bank has far more data than any other um, uh, and, and, and much higher frequency data than any other uh, you know, uh, line of business. And so the retail side has been uh, at the forefront of embracing machine learning techniques in doing, let's say, fraud analysis and, and even uh, including um, uh, credit line assignments, let's say. The second is around regulatory concerns. And so wherever there are regulatory concerns around embracing MLAI, we've seen a little bit of a lag in embracing such techniques. But now, you know, with new explainability techniques and the fact that more and more people are getting comfortable with these explainability techniques, uh, these uh, uh, regulatory concerns are not quite as um, difficult to mitigate today as they were, let's say, three or, even three or four years back. They're far easier to mitigate today. And so uh, a lot more uh, types of models are being developed, um, you know, such as credit decisioning, for example, which three or four years back may not have used ML techniques, but today are more willing to do so because of new explainability uh, techniques that are available to us. So in terms of what comes next, uh, you know, I would say that um, the, again, the retail side is probably the, the, the best uh, position to embrace MLAI. The investment bank is probably um, a, a distant second. Um, you know, asset and wealth management, commercial banking, uh, things along those lines are probably uh, going to be um, further behind in, in terms of embracing such techniques. 
And of course, this other thing is real-time recalibration. I think, um, you know, over the next two to five years, um, real-time recalibration is probably going to become much more prevalent than it is today. I, right now, almost no one uses real-time recalibration. Got it. I, I can give some recent information about the regulatory view. It's just last week I was in a different conference and David Palmer, who's the lead author of SR7, was the lead speaker, the plenary speaker. And he talked quite a bit about AI and ML used in finance. I know a year ago, I, this same question was posed to him and he simply said, we're, we're still forming an opinion. Uh, he spent quite a bit of time in his presentation now talking about AI, ML, and some of the shortcomings like the quality of data, massive amounts of data being used, they're not all of the same quality. But he did indicate, I think very clearly, that the FRB is close to issuing guidance on uh, the validation and management of ML models and finance. So that'll be an interesting document to read, to see, see what they come up with. Definitely, he's not against it. A second factor that's really going to promote AI and ML over this horizon talking about is continual pressure that we see at every firm to get more done with less, do more with less work. I mean, unfortunately, these um, lines of defense functions like validation uh, tend to get uh, cut very first. <laughs> the first ones to have their budgets cut when budgets are being reduced. That, that's happened repeatedly at Credit Suisse at Morgan Stanley uh, because it doesn't generate profits. And so there's real pressure to, to do the same amount of work or more work uh, but to do it with fewer resources. And ML really offers a solution to that problem because it takes a lot of the manual part of the validation process off the shoulders of, of the, the validators and allows them to concentrate on more of the conceptual level issues. And there are a lot of mundane uh, processes that go into validation and much of it today is still being done in what I call the 20th century manner. I mean, we're still very 20th century in the way we review documentation, validators, generate their own independent tests, usually manually, scenario testing, uh, review of data quality. A lot of this is a very manual process and a lot of it to ML. So I, I see a real advantage in reducing uh, the, the overhead required for, for uh, model risk management and therefore a greater role even going forward for these, these practices of AI ML. Awesome. So, uh, you know, uh, Alex, you oversee a team that uses AI. You know, I have a large team that uh, identifies you know, market investing trends using AI. You know, when doing due diligence, how do you balance like you know model-based recommendations versus human judgment? You know, how 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 is how are you, how are you how is your team doing that? Right. Well, I think I th I think it it's it, the short answer is it has to be complementary. I think we're we're at least in the discretionary investment world world we're not at a point where a model can make an actual um, investment decision. We are probably at a point where the most models or, or at least a large external data effort gets you a few things. First, um, it lets you prioritize attention across too many data sets for a human to consider. Um, and then second, you can quantify uncertainty um, in a way that I think humans either have trouble doing or, or just cannot calculate, right? So we don't make decisions, you know, we, we never let the model make a pure decision. We won't make an investment simply because our algorithm thinks it's a good investment. But we do use those algorithms to surface, hey, what are the top 10 ideas? Like, you know, to, to be concrete about this, right? Imagine on our, in our venture business, we're considering sort of the universe of SaaS companies. And we have a series of data sets ranging from uh, web traffic to the number of Twitter followers to the number of GitHub stars, right? So you, so you really have like a diverse, high cardinality data set around what could be good startups. And of course you have historical data you could train on as to what in the past has led to good outcomes. Um, again, I, I just don't think the venture or frankly investment management world is ready to automate the human decision-making away. And, and especially in private markets, you're still deal making, right? There's still a human component to, to, to making an investment. So I think we're, we're we're not yet at the point where we could, with a straight face, make make that sort of decision or that judgment. I think we're just so far away from that. But we are at the point where the model can say, here are the top ten recommendations these companies inflected. Here's our trending algorithm for interesting private investments you can make, and you're prioritizing time and and, and so on. So I think in, in those cases. Um, it's useful. Um, I'll add as well, again, for, I, I think the big trend going on in investment management is just the massive integration of external data sets. 
and beyond the traditional Reuters fact set, you know, traditional accounting data. As I mentioned, everybody's using the high cardinality data sets, these alternative data sets that are sort of unique and different. And I think the other big thing AI or ML gets you in those data sets is uh, attention prioritization. So if you have 50 different predictions for how the next quarter for Walmart will shape up, it's very hard for any human to consider. Even if you let the human make the decision, 50 different predictions is too much. So having an algorithm quantify the uncertainty, quantify the dispersion, give you a confidence interval, anything um, saves a fair bit of time. Yep. Awesome. So while we talk about you know, the future of AI, you know, applications in retail banking, potentially investment banking, and automating model validation, all is not so well with AI, right? I mean, we have, you know, we have seen, uh, you know, uh, bias issues, uh, you know, in the last few months, you know, like we all heard about the Apple credit card uh, bias issues, United Healthcare bias issues, you know, algorithmic discrimination is a big topic. Uh, you know, Patrick, you know, how you how do you think about you know algorithmic discrimination and and how, how do you see like for example uh, ways to address this in in, in financial institutions and, and what is the importance of that? Sure. Um, so, first off, you know, algorithmic discrimination is is a, a really serious problem and and a really difficult to fix problem. Okay, it's not it's not just going to be fixed by tech tools and technology. It's a it's a complex socio technical problem. So, so with that said, I you know I think that the fair lending groups, especially in consumer finance, have a lot of experience at at hunting down. Uh, discrimination and, and remediating it. Machine learning is, you know, just like everything else, is kind of a, a coin with two sides. So, so machine learning models, you know, well, well, first I should say linear models can be discriminatory, right? And and there's lots of proof of this. Um, machine learning models just maybe hide discrimination, right? It, especially in the in the consumer uh, lending context. Like if we're talking about facial recognition, which I just would not do. Uh, then, then we're talking about a whole different can of worms. But, but like in the consumer finance context, ma machine learning models are simply, you know, they're going to hide the discrimination and maybe bring in some some weird sort of local or individual discrimination issues. Uh, and, and so, like many of the panelists have said, it, it's a question of updating processes to to handle the differences between machine learning and and more traditional uh, predictive models. Now. That said, you know, I, I, I informally study these machine learning failures and, um, and work informally with Partnership on AI and they're gonna be releasing a formal study soon. But, but, you know, algorithmic discrimination is just one of many kinds of failures that can affect machine learning systems. And, and I'll go ahead and throw out data privacy as, as sort of the second most common one that, that we see at BNH.AI. And, um, it's just quite simply people do not consider that data about people is a highly regulated quantity, even in the United States and perhaps worse in the United States because it's regulated state by state. Um, and, and so people just seem to think like if they're putting data into a machine learning system, then privacy laws don't apply. But of course, that's, that's not the case. And, and so, you know, algorithmic discrimination, horrible problem. Uh, Machine learning can exacerbate it, can present some solutions, but just one of many types of, of machine learning failures that banks and other companies need to be aware of. So happy to elaborate on that if there's time, but but we'll, we'll kind of shut up now. So, so maybe like, I mean, for Michelle, like from a model risk management perspective, where does bias come into picture? You know, how are you thinking about it? How, how are you thinking about it? figuring out ways to detect it, mitigate it, and, 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 and like not get into troubled waters? You're on mute, uh, Michelle. And well, that was bound to happen, but <laughs> perfect. Okay. So yeah, it bias is a critical uh, piece of the puzzle when it comes to managing model risk in general. And as you, you rightly mentioned, um, model uh, machine learning models in particular uh, act just extend the risk of bias. So the approach that I use, um, regardless of the type of risk that I'm dealing with is understanding, first of all, what do I know about the model that I'm dealing with? What is unclear and what are the controls around 
uh, that um, complexity, that uh, the piece that isn't clear. And that helps shape the, the framework or process or procedure that needs to be leveraged to mitigate the risk. So if you think of models as being black box, right? You have what's coming into the model, you have what's coming outside of the model, and then you have that black box that you can poke into from an explainability perspective to get a sense of how, what's going on in the model. <clears throat> and when we talk about um, algorithm bias and data bias and all of that, we need to make sure that the process that we have in place look at the input or the data coming into the model, but also look at the output of the model, making sure, because that's exactly where you could tell whether or not bias happened. And from a model risk management perspective, um, we are making sure that we bring the team of experts that have that knowledge. So it has to be uh, a cross-functional governance process that include the, the statistics for expert, the AI machine learning expert, but also the compliance team from fair learning perspective but then also bringing to the, the privacy team uh, to look into potential fairness issues as well in the, in the data. And ultimately the one piece that I haven't heard so far, which I think is important, is also bring IT risk from a control perspective um, because ultimately um, there is um, additional adversarial attack risk that can come into with the use of AI and machine learning models. So I, uh, my take on it from an MRM perspective is just making sure that whatever process or procedure that we put together, uh, regardless of the risk that we're trying to, to mitigate, bring together a cross-functional view. And that's the only way we'll make sure that uh, models risk or AI risk are uh, rightly uh, mitigated or managed. Yep, yep. So John, I think one of the things that we are noticing in the market is, uh, banks are instituting these AI governance teams in, in addition to these model risk management teams as they get more and more of these uh, machine learning models being developed by the first line of defense. How do you propose like, you know, if a bank is thinking about institutionalizing that model governance practice for AI models, you know, what are some of the differences between the standard validation process and the new process? And how should they think about this and embed this in their AI life cycle? and who needs to be involved, what capabilities uh, such a system should have. Can you elaborate on that? As Pavan pointed out, the, the basic structure is still conforms with SR117, but the devil's in the details because these models are distinctly different from traditional quant models. Uh, quant models are bounded by something that used to be called the curse of dimensionality, which was a way of saying that humans who build these models can only deal with so much data, so many uh, variables of input, and then it just gets too complicated. Machine learning models completely break that curse because they have almost an endless appetite for lots of data. And many of it, because the kinds of data that sources have broadened dramatically with the use of ML, there, there can be real issues with data quality. So a lot more in, in, attention needs to be paid to the quality, particularly of unusual or bespoke, un, uh, uncommonly used data resources that are now being incorporated into ML models. So data is one issue. The second issue, because of these uncertainties are around ML models uh, and problems with explainability, they're going to need more intensive independent testing and, and definitely more intensive ongoing monitoring. So uh, David Palmer actually addressed this. He said he's clearly of allowing these models to be used in finance, but he said you're going to have to uh, increase the level of discipline around these models with, with greater controls, more, more circumspect, more focused in, uh, ongoing monitoring and be careful with all that data that you're bringing in, make sure that it's valid. But the basic process for validating a model is, is, has remained unchanged. You still have to perform conceptual soundness. You have to say, is this the best right model to use for this application? Um, as, as an aside, something I teach uh, all the time, the purpose of model validation is not to prove that the model is correct in the sense of a principle of physics, because no models are really correct, and particularly in finance. The, what validation does is decide, is this model uh, adequate for its intended purpose? Not even the best model. Could, is it sufficient for purpose? Uh, as uh, George Box books put it in a famous statement, uh, the real question is, not is the model correct, but 
is it so wrong that it's no longer useful? And that's, that should be a mantra for everybody working in validation. The, the second issue I wanna to point to is, we've been talking about validation almost exclusively in terms of model risk management. Actually, there's a concept of governance around all of this, and it's a much broader uh, aspect. And uh, that's something I came to appreciate in my last position because governance covers the entire life cycle of the model. And validation is just one phase of that life cycle, a critical phase. But governance also includes inventory. Governance, and this is all part of model risk, includes inventory, includes um, interdependencies between models and data. And you would think, take inventory, you think that would be pretty straightforward. You just collect all your models, put them in inventory. Well, the devil is in the details. And until you go through this process, you don't realize, I doubt that there's any bank that actually knows how many models they have that are actually being used. Because, and there are many reasons for that. One of the reasons being which people who develop models under the radar don't want to declare them because they have to go through all this validation. So a lot of EU's, what are called EUC models, end user control models on spreadsheets fall into this category. So inventory is a real challenge actually. And one of the questions I ask in my paper is, can any bank answer this question? Pick a model at random, or not, sorry, don't pick a model, but tell me, I'm a bank examiner, tell me if you have any models in your inventory that were not executed over the last year. Yep. And when I was in that position, my answer would be, well, if it wasn't executed, why should I care? And a banker exam say, well, you should care because maybe it should have been executed. Yep. But if you can tell me, you give me a list of all the models you have in your inventory that didn't get executed over a year, then I know you've got a higher level of model discipline than most banks, most other firms. So th there are a lot of issues outside of validation that it, because models do not uh, perform standalone, mostly within a firm, they, they operate within a model ecosystem. And ecosystem is a critical word here, and that covers a, the whole gamut of interrelations between models. The other issue, as I said, is model interdependence. Uh, that's also a very patchy area because it relies mostly on attestation by model owners. And you find out very quickly model owners don't know who all their users are, so they can't tell you what all the downstream dependencies are. And that's another conundrum. Really? So when, when, yeah, exactly. Patrick, when, when, you, when a bank discovers these models that you shouldn't be running in production and get into this incident response mode, how, do they hand, how should they handle it? You know, maybe so, so, yeah, just, just really quickly, I, I, there's a gap, in my opinion, and I'd love to hear if the other panelists agree, but we probably don't have time. Incident response is not addressed in SR 11.7. I mean, if, on a close reading, it says have contingency plans, but then it moves on to the next paragraph. And so we prepare for planes to crash. We prepare for other computer systems to fail. We need to be preparing for machine learning and AI systems to fail because they can fail in complex and unpredictable ways. So, so just really quickly, I want to, to plug this idea that I think is a gap in sort of the current regulation, which is explicit plans for, for instant response. And, and I'm happy to, to chime in on, on what I think that means, but, but we're running out of time, so I don't want to take other people's times. Got it. Yeah, so, so Pawan, when you, when maybe to round up, you know, when you kind of think about model governance and explainable AI, you know, you you're, you're have a center of excellence group at JP Morgan. Now, how are you introducing the concepts of explainability to the broader organization? I guess I'm assuming that your job is to make sure that, you know, models are built in a, in a well-formed manner and you're, you know, they're governed properly. How are you, how are you doing that today? So, you know, obviously there's been a lot of stakeholder interest in explainability over the last, you know, year or so, especially uh, given the adoption of these MLAI models, you know, whether it's a regulatory concern, you know, as is with credit decisioning models, for example, or if it's a, um, a client concern as it would be with order placement models or algorithmic trading models, there's a lot of interest. And so, you know, what we've done is we've uh, established an XAI center of excellence that basically does uh, three things. The first is you know, pure research into methodologies uh, around explainability. The second is to advise uh, developers on what are the best methodologies to use in their models. And the third is to upscale effectively, make sure that every one of these guys that are developing models are um, you know, uh, getting the right set of skills that are required for explainability techniques. And, uh, and so that's on the model development side. On the control side, which I'm a, a part of, um, you, know, we have, um, you know, we have researchers who are actually working on the applied side of explainability. So for example, you know, we publish research around questions such as, 
um, if we generate a reason code using a machine learning model, such as a tree model, tree-based model, um, is the reason code more trustworthy than the reason code that you would get from a statistical model? Mm. Uh, does the nonlinearity of machine learning models pose a challenge for reason code generation? Those are the kind of, you know, broadly speaking questions that we answer in the research that we publish. Obviously, this is all internal research, yep. um, but, uh, but that's the second way that we are dealing with this, uh, this problem. Awesome. So we are on, on, on dot now. Uh, thank you so much for all the panelists for joining. This was an illuminating discussion for me. Uh, I've learned a ton. Uh, and uh, we are also going to share some of the resources. John has a, an amazing paper on some of the challenges that today's model risk managers face. We're going to put this on the Zoom channel for people to you know, download and read. And, uh, and I finally want to thank all our panelists for spending their time today and discussing this very important topic. Thank you so much. Thank you.